Good morning, upper sixth. Here we are, bullet point 5B, or continued, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, lots to talk about finance, but this, this section is really focusing on the benefits and issues of planning. So if we're thinking about planning, we're thinking about an entire supply chain here. It's really important that we understand where lots of fashion retailers in the UK will think about far in advance what they're going to get into their shops. We need to think about the lead times between the, you know, the concepts, the forecasting of trends, fabric colours, you know, what are people going to be wearing? How can they influence this in the marketplace? How much of this is going to be influenced by fashion, high-end fashion that then eventually finds the new styles on the Primani coat hangers through to that more homogenous stuff that might be the cash cow stuff of a retailer, the white t-shirts, the denim jeans, the black shoes, those sorts of things we would like to think of as more reliable for forecasting because we've got previous sales data. Now the previous sales data is only as good as how relevant it is to the current situation and the future. So for example, if I'm basing my sales forecasting on data before COVID, well, we've had COVID since, shopping patterns have changed, and actually the whole retail landscape has changed in some, some sectors, including some well-known fashion brands that have either gone into liquidation or they've been bought up by larger potential conglomerates. Um, we have to think about those sorts of things. We've seen a decline on the high street, but the high street is still there. We've talked about Next and how they're the cockroach of the high street, and they seem to be surviving but they're still evolving they're still planning for the future and that's one of the things that we will explore in this video ignore any text that you can see on the screen i didn't edit any spelling mistakes out of the um auto generated stuff so let's talk about jd sports very popular brand uh this is not really a sports brand even though it says that they're jd sports and they are the king of trainers according to their own marketing department in strapline um but this is a fashion retailer in the sports sector now they have had a huge rise to fame they're doing very well um and january 23 we can see that they're doing very well they've talked talked about selling to a certain market segment and they're selling loads and loads of Air Force Ones at 115 quid. And they're also selling lots and lots of premium track suits. OK, so we, we understand what they're selling. We understand their price position in the marketplace. We've got slightly more budget conscious customers going to Sports Direct. Online, we might have M&M Direct, which are obviously another like TK Maxx style of sports retailer. And again, sports fashion, trainers, football boots, those sorts of things. So we, we need to think about where they are in the marketplace. They are at the more premium end of the sports retailing market and they you know, are proud of that. OK, we can then see another article in May. Um, so a few months later by a different newspaper and we've got lovely bits down here for 2023-24 it forecasts 1.03 billion pounds in line with current average consensus expectations i'm presuming that means multiple sources multiple very bright educated people not just the board of directors from jd sports if I take that at face value. So a number of people in the industry are going post COVID, people are wanting to spend more money on expensive trainers and track suits. JD Sports is the king of trainers. I presume that's what that badge says there. Um, and basically we're all expecting things to happen like they're planned. We then think about the supply chain. So we've got these forecasts, we've, we've had this record, record upward trajectory in sales and profitability, and we are planning for this. What do we do? This is where you should be shouting at the screen, either hurry up or 
buy lots of trainers, stick them in a warehouse, get ready. As a, as a customer, I am not patient. I expect 24 hour delivery on nearly everything that I buy. I will not wait three weeks for anything. So if you're gonna to have to order stuff from Nike or their suppliers, possibly on another continent, um, that lead time might cost you the sale. And if someone else has my Nike Air Force Ones, trust me, I'm more loyal to Nike than I am to JD Sports. So we need to also understand where the loyalty is. The loyalty might not be to JD Sports. It might just be convenient because they're on the high street. It might be just convenience because I've heard their advert on the radio and therefore I've gone onto their website. I go on there, I'm looking for my new 115 pound Nike Air Force Ones. They don't have them. So I don't buy them from them. I then continue my search and I buy them directly from Nike who would much rather sell me Nike trainers than allow JD Sports because they then are making more profitability. Okay, remember when Nike sell to JD Sports, JD Sports need to make a profit. If the RRP, the retail recommended price is 115 quid, JD Sports need to make profit. Therefore, if Nike sell them directly to me, and it is Nike and not just a, a franchise, a dealer of Nike, then Nike will make more profitability. There is a, an argument here for direct to consumer. We're seeing a lot of this in the car industry and we know that Nike and Adidas have been stopping supplying lots of sports retailers because they don't want them to sell their trainers. They want to sell them directly to consumers. Now this is a more recent phenomena, um, but things change over time. This is where your crystal ball looking into the future are big mops fans. Um, we're thinking, however, in the future, if Nike decide to sell only directly to customers, okay, suddenly, how does that impact JD Sports, where lots of their profitability is coming from Nike Air Force Ones? Well, if they can't sell Nike Air Force Ones anymore, maybe this is going to impact them. We shall see what happens with this story. But remember, this is May 2023, so relatively recently. And then, sorry for all the lines, um, we've got lower than expected like-for-like -like growth in 22 weeks to Christmas. Now, 22 weeks to Christmas seems like a very long time. The problem in the UK is we are addicted to the colour red. Or black, actually, if it's Black Friday. Um, we are addicted to the concept of sales. Now, in the good old days of retail, you would have the golden quarter. So retailers would make most of their profit profits during the build up to Christmas and in the January sales. And that quarter, as in quarter of a year, yeah, there's 12 months in a year, you can work out what a quarter is, um, that was the build up. And there wasn't pre-Christmas sales because it was seasonality came into it. People were willing to save up their money and then buy their Christmas presents. And there was a big rush on all the high streets and shopping centres days, days before the internet, not that long ago, kids. And people would basically spend their hard-earned money. And, pe and poorer families would save up pretty much all year or be willing to get in debt and then hopefully pay it off before the following Christmas, if they're lucky. Now we have Black Friday. Black Friday is this big sales event where supposedly, um, through psychological pricing, we feel we're getting a discount. Consumers are wising up to this. They pretty much know that can, you know companies probably put their prices up before Black Friday and then lower them, so, hence the link to psychological pricing. Then Black Friday became Black Friday week. And then it became Black Friday month. And then we had the pre-Christmas sales. And then we had the, I don't know, Christmas Eve sales. And then we had the Boxing Day sales, which we've always really had. Um, and then it carries on into the January sales. So Cyber Monday was obviously, you know, around about the time of Black Friday as well. We've got all of these sales. Now, part of the reason that um, their forecasts were down, according to um, JD Sports, were um, the threat from 
um, other companies. So we've got pre-Christmas down. We've got people are spending more money in sales, so they won't be willing to spend as much money on full price trainers, for example. Um, we've then got external pestle factors, cost of living pressures. This is a squeeze on real incomes. I'm thinking of a YED question, which would be fantastic if we got that. We've done it about 100 times in class. Um, and then we've got threat of substitutes, trendy online sellers like Lululemon. Yeah, so Lululemon don't sell many trainers, but they do lots of other um, athletic wear, for example. So maybe those that have money are looking for something a little bit more niche and a bit more, sorry to use the word, but trendy than JD Sports, the king of trainers. Um, and those people that don't might go to Sports Direct. Okay, because they're perceived as a discount retailer. And yes, they sell the full price trainers, but it might be instead of me getting the 2024 Nike Airs, I get the 2023s and they've got a sticker next to it saying 30% off. Well, we understand because we've done this countless times with Apple in class that different trainers will have different pro product life cycles depending when they were, were when they were launched. It could be that our trainers come out with price skimming. So it starts off with 115 quid. And then when it goes into the old, slightly older version, they've reached that rapid growth and they've got to maturity. And now the sales are slowing down a little bit. And before it goes into the decline stage, let's reposition the trainer into a different price position. That then brings the price down by say 30%, that's what the red ticket would probably say in Sports Direct, and then it attracts a slightly different customer. This extends the product life cycle by moving it into a different market position. In the, and this is also complemented by the brand new Nike Airs coming out for say 150 quid, because I walk into Sports Direct, I dream of 150 quid, I can't afford it or I'm not willing to pay 150 pounds next to it, are the cheaper ones from last year. And I say, oh, I just fancy a pair of Nike Airs. Sports Direct don't care because they've sold me a pair of trainers and I'm walking out. There might even be more profit margin on the discounted one, by the way, because Nike might be trying to get rid of their old stock and selling it on the cheap to Sports Direct. It might be that that full priced expensive one has less margin on it, but they'll use the, the marketing brand pull because all, all, if you think about the, the concept of growth of a new product in a marketplace, Nike are spending millions on sponsorship and advertising telling you about these brand new trainers so you don't go and buy a pair of Adidas. So it's really, really important that Sports Direct, JD Sports, all of these types of firms ride on the back of this advertising. And no better way of doing that by sticking last year's trainers next to them because they hopefully will sell themselves to a slightly more price conscious market segment. Think about different product life cycles running alongside at the same time. Think about the language we use with product portfolios with the Boston Matrix. It could be that the brand new Nike Airs are the rising star. The rising stars need to maintain that growth normally through lots and lots of advertising. Whereas that cash cow could be last year's trainers. Okay, you're not spending money on advertising them. You're getting them in hopefully on a better on a better price than they were a year ago, and hopefully they sell themselves because they're just next to the more expensive ones. Then, when we're talking about threat of substitutes, don't just think about threat of substitutes of other trainer companies like I've just been mentioning. In this, which I've lifted, I think from the Times. It talks about, obviously, Tesco's and Sainsbury's are having strong sales. Does this mean they're selling more potatoes at Christmas? Or is it just because the potatoes are more expensive? Bad example, actually, because they discounted potatoes, turkeys, gin, whatever, whatever they're going to put the price up. We know that there's food inflation in the economy. We're told nearly every time we turn on the radio or read a newspaper that food inflation is still there, even though it's a bit better than it used to be. Last Christmas, food inflation was you know, in the news a lot because we were all quite scared of it. This actually changes my sensitivity to price. 
I'm constantly being told by the press that my prices are going up, therefore I'm expecting it when I go into the shops, therefore I plan for it and maybe I'm still going to buy my Christmas turkey and gin. Okay? I might not have enough money to go and buy myself a new pair of trainers, I might wait until the January sales. I might just suck it up and wear my dirty old trainers for another 12 months. So, threat of substitutes in a market where they're blaming the cost of living pressures on underperformance against their targets could be rising food prices. Okay? Fashion, sports, Burberry, the luxury brand. If you see luxury mentioned in a case study, you've got to be talking about YED possibly. It's one of those theories that examiners are looking for. PED, YED, product life cycle, seasonality, those sorts of things. Even if the question is not directly asking it. Don't answer 8 and 10 markers with extra stuff. Save that for your 12s and 20s. Just answer the 8s and um, 10s for the obvious reasons. I've mentioned lots of terms from Porter's Five Forces, and remember here that threat of substitutes, for example, um, could possibly come from the food sector, where people are making decisions. They're also making decisions to pay their mortgages because the Bank of England base rate's gone up. Their car loan repayments have gone up. There's lots of people in the UK that are living with lovely shiny cars that they don't own and they are possibly going to get higher interest charges on those. We've seen a lot of people's mortgage rates go up. I'm sure some of your parents um, frequently complain how much their mortgages now are compared to two years ago. Well, that money needs to come from somewhere. Um, and it might be that you get last year's trainers instead of this year's. <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, Next were caught because they did better than expected. Now, this is still not performing to your forecasting. There's a whole slide on overtrading, which I don't think this is um, at the end of this presentation. But it could be. So if Next suddenly they get a brand new line in and they advertise it extensively, it's their rising star product in their new stores, hopefully they're going to sell loads of these and loads of other stuff as well to make loads and loads of profits and revenue. Um, it's so popular that it sells out. The advertising message is out there. People walk into the store, they can't buy it. They get very cross or mildly disappointed. They walk out of the Milton Keynes next and they walk across the road to John Lewis. John Lewis, sell them something similar. Thank you very much. Maybe I've enjoyed the John Lewis experience so much, I never come back to next. So the problem with getting your forecasting wrong from the other way, now we're obviously talking about not having enough stock possibly, is you can upset your customers. Um, and we've talked about how Marks and Spencers did this um, a few years ago because of their manufacturers being based in China. Um, and they use more local suppliers in Spain and Portugal to make some of their stuff that they think might be harder to forecast. The cash cow stuff is still made in China because they feel that it's easier to forecast, easier to plan, easier to get the right quantities into the right stores. Therefore, let's make it cheaper in China. The stuff they need more flexibility with a higher production cost because of it being in the EU and not China, they might need to ask for more yeah so you if you want flexibility in your supply chain location to stores can be quite important but also it's the capacity of the manufacturers and don't think that there is a textiles factory just waiting for marks and spencers to pick the phone up and say please sir can i have some more um, they will be making stuff for other people they all understand capacity utilization um, the same as ra level business students OK, empty warehouses, empty, you know, switched off sewing machines don't generate profit. So let's make sure that we're making stuff 52 weeks a year. Uh, and that way we can maximise capacity and profitability of our square footage.
Go careful if you under order stuff. Now, it turns out that this probably, according to the news, wasn't because of not ordering enough stock because they messed up their sales forecasts. We've got higher than expected levels of full priced trading. I'm thinking price skimming. Wonderful question. So we bring out a brand new product at the beginning of the product life cycle. We advertise it. We stick it into our stores. We give it prime place on our website. We ping out loads of social media and email marketing to our already loyal customers. And people come in and it's at a premium price because it's just been released. It's the brand new thing for the season. I don't know, jeggings again. We do love a pair of jeggings. Um, and people come in and they buy them. They buy them before they have to put the price down. Remember, I've just finished the definition of skimming. I've not just said premium pricing, competitive pricing. If you don't bring the price back down, it's not skimming, is it? It's like with penetration pricing. If you just mention a certain level of a price and you forget to put it up in the future, you've not actually defined the pricing strategy properly. It's a common mistake, which is why those questions are frequently in exam papers. Price skimming in the fashion industry makes a lot of sense as an exam question. We shall see, obviously, in, in May and June. So if we think about it, you know, they've launched the brand new products, people are paying a premium for them, and actually they're so successful, they decide not to put the price down. There we go, higher than expected levels of full price. Their computer programs, their sales analysts will be tracking these performance against their forecasts to make sure they've got enough stock and everything else. And they've just th they've thought to themselves, hang on, these premium jeggings are selling without discounting them. Our planned price reduction should be cancelled. I'm guessing that they did that. I don't know. I'm making this up to illustrate a point. Whereas if we're talking about assess the likely impact of using a price skimming strategy and we've got a case study on sales forecasting, you've got to think about how companies might be flexible in the future. However, lo I love mops in the future. If they sell more jeggings at full price at the beginning of the product launch, they may decide to abandon their price skimming strategy for that product because it's selling at the higher price. This will help them to maximise profitability and continue to sell jeggings. Something like that. Don't think that just because you make a decision, it can't be changed. There's a lot of technology and expertise that goes into tracking sales performance. On the other scale, it could be that they plan a price skimming strategy and they don't sell hardly any of them at the beginning of the product life cycle and they actually bring forward in time when they're going to discount these jeggings. Okay, You do not want last year's jeggings stuck on a shelf in a warehouse for the following year. Number one, you've got that lost sales and profit opportunity. Number two, you need to pay for storage. Uh, number three, they might be last year's fabric. Next, need to keep the illusion of new, up to date. How could I possibly live without next year's fabric and patterns and pretty, I don't know, flowers on my jeggings? Well, if they only bring out the same stuff every single year, if it's made to a good enough quality, which quite a lot of it probably isn't, um, then I might just keep it. Remember our point in an earlier um, video on built-in obsolescence. However, 4% increase in profits overall, um, but it does sound like a wonderful story and that's probably one of the reasons why their share price went up. Now, on to our comparisons. So we've got four of the market leaders here and this is a fascinating slide. If you think about the percentage of the sales in the UK, so if we're thinking about the percentage of the sales in the UK here, we can see our good friends next, 85% are in the UK. On the other end of the scale, we've got 8.3% of Burberry in the UK. We have 
global niche market, we have not very global mass market. We can talk about the market segments, we can talk about something related to, I thought of this question, assess the, assess the likely importance of the UK fashion retail sector to choose your firm. 12 markers so we can talk about the future. Now the brand identity of Burberry is that ethnocentric quintessentially British brand and being present in the UK is probably very important. 8.3% of that is still a big chunk of cash um, and potential profitability and everything else. But we need to think about how this is important to them as a global brand. I'm sure they've got their signature stores, um, normally probably where there's loads of tourists. Um, you know, we, we, we've got obviously the discount village just down the road from the school where there's lots of premium brands and designer labels at discounted prices. Um, and also you have to think about their distribution channels. So Burberry may have a couple of their own stores. They also might have a couple of privately owned franchise stores. Other than that, they're distributing through their own website. There's costs involved with that. It's depending which country they're in and will vary, by the way. And then they're selling through third parties like to department stores, whereas next sell through their own shops, their own website, and then they'll use delivery, distribution and stuff like that. So it's a different business model. So that's quite important. Looking at other things in here as well, we can see the difference in profitability here. Um, we can see operating profits from our overextended ASOS. So if we want to talk about over trading linked into forecasting, these guys looked like they were the next unicorn. You know, they were doing well before COVID. COVID kicked in. It was clearly the new way of shopping, everyone thought. And I was one of them, definitely. Thought, oh my goodness, this is going to bring on the decline faster in um, high streets. And then we went past COVID. They were still growing a bit. And then things stopped. One of those external shocks for them in some ways, not, not the entire um, industry, was threat of substitutes, those new entrants coming into the market, which was Sheen, started gobbling up some of their market share. We saw that in a previous video. So this is based on sales forecasting. We need new warehouses. We need extra stock. Um, and all of these things, the forecasts were wrong, unfortunately, um, and they're paying the price. Hopefully this is just a blip. But in the meantime, being a PLC, shareholders have got very nervous, sold shares. Basic rule of supply and demand. Excess supply, or standard supply, I should say, and limited demand. Well, people are selling it, price goes down, don't they? It's the same, it, you know, it, is, it is what happens in shares. So suddenly their investors are thinking, hang on, we'll see. Now, if you look at the finance that they're taking on, this is cost to the business of finance. Um, we can see that actually out of all of them, Next are borrowing more, slightly more, but more, um, significantly more than Burberry. Now, you could look at this from a purely financial perspective, and we will in a bit, um, or you can think about this from a strategic perspective. What are they doing with the money? Why are they borrowing if they're making, you know, before tax profits of 870 million? Well, where do the profits go? OK, if I can get rid of some of these profits, maybe I'll just pay off all my debt. I'm going to pay less tax. Well, that would make sense, I suppose. However, we are a PLC. We need our shareholders to be happy. Let's give them some dividends. Let's let them know we've we've survived COVID and here's your reward for being loyal. And if the shareholders believe that the future is bright for next, they will stay with them. More shareholders will want shares. Share price goes up. We've seen that in a previous video. OK, so just because there's a bit of debt here. We can decide what a bit looks like in a minute using some um, some of the business theory doesn't mean it's bad as long as their sales forecasts are correct okay so we have to keep that into consideration whenever we're thinking about this so we're moving on so we're thinking about 
stock. Look at JD. So JD Sports have got a bucket load of stock. I wonder why. Well, maybe they've bulk bought some stuff in. They've got some discount on it. Their sales forecasting says this is what's happening. We're on the crest of the wave. We're doing really, really well. This is to January 23. Um, for next, it you know, hopefully it's roughly the same figures for the rest of them. So we're in the same time period. So they are on the crest of this wave at the moment. The press told us at the beginning of this video that you know, they're forecasting 1.03 billion in sales. We need the stock in the warehouse. We need to be able to fulfill these orders, online orders within 24 hours. People want their Nike trainers. They are loyal to Nike, not necessarily to JD Sports. OK, very, very important. Um, so we've got enough information here probably to do gearing. Hey, Do you want to pause the video and do some gearing calculations? Maybe. So we've got the formula down the bottom. Um, and very quickly, you should be practicing this. You should have a look at this and don't presume that one company is going to be more favorable, shall we say, from a gearing perspective than another just because of the success stories we've been talking about. So here's some quick um, calculations, which I didn't do. And we can see same format, practice, 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 and you're going to be absolutely fine. Then, when we actually put the numbers in, next is got the highest gearing ratio. You then need to decide how to present this in an essay. So this is an essay, you know, assess the likely importance of low gearing to next PLC. Well, you can answer part of the answer using the numerical data. In your chain of argument, you can talk about how you calculated it, the answer, um, and then you can compare it to the likes of, I don't know, Burberry, JD Sports, whichever one you want, um, and say, actually, their gearing is higher, so this might not be a good thing in context, clearly. However, we then need to think about the qualitative stuff that we've been talking about. And we've been talking about their share price going up because of confidence in the marketplace. We're talking about their online business um, now making significantly more profits than their retail business. I've talked about how they're closing some small high street stores in favour of opening in destination shopping experience shopping centres like Milton Keynes and um, Rushton Lakes, for example. All of those sorts of things cost money. Maybe that's where they're spending their money. So threats possibly, you know, we know that they've got some debt um, and the debt could actually cost them more money. We know those external threats are Bank of England base rates gone up. I don't know the conditions of their loan. Hopefully it's on some sort of fixed term thing. But if it's on a variable rate, they are paying significantly more for that debt. Uh, they have more debt than some of the competitors that we've listed here. Because retail can be a fickle beast, um, and we're not going to default to, however, if there was another global pandemic, please, just don't do it, um, then it could be that suddenly H&M pick up a load of business because of the cost of living crisis, and people decide they're not going to go to Next anymore, they're going to go to H&M. Maybe the interest rates go up more. Maybe oil prices go up even more. Look at the horribleness that's going on um, in the Suez Canal at the moment. You know, that's having an impact on distribution around the world. More, more companies are using airplanes to transport. Oil prices have gone up again and planes are more expensive than ships to transport cheap clothes. So, you know, this, this could impact next as well, making this worse. However, think about the opportunities. You know, who would have thought that there's going to be a swap question, possibly? Take advantage of this growth. Let's invest now. We are the cockroach of the high street. If I see that in anyone's essays this year, um, I will chuckle to myself. But um, we are the cockroach of the high street. Therefore, if we don't invest in these new destination shopping experience shops beyond Rushton Lakes and all the other ones that are building at the moment. 
yeah, then what about our competitors? Maybe our competitors will, and maybe our customers still need to go into a shop as well as buy online, even though we're making loads of money online. In addition to that, you'll see some of their investments in online a little bit later as well. So looking here, we've got some pre-COVID stuff. I'm hoping that they don't do too much pre-COVID, but you never know, um, because that's when the accounts were published. But we, we, need, we need to think about pre-COVID versus post-COVID, and don't forget about COVID. There are lots of people that use companies and brands that they may not have used until they've interacted with them um, during COVID. Yeah, so one I spoke about um, in class, um, was the British Honey Company. Now, I'd never heard of the British Honey Company until COVID. I was one of the many crazy people that needed hand sanitizer no matter what. Um, went on the internet, they were selling five litres of this stuff. They're a gin company. Thought I'd have a bottle of gin. Um, as a Dalmatian, I was allowed. So, you know, so those sorts of things. Suddenly I'm interacting with brands I'd never even thought of before. Yeah, I haven't been back since, by the way. Um, but there you go. So we've got some interesting figures here. You can dwell on them. You can you can see and compare and contrast if you want to. Um, unless the case study talks extensively about COVID, I would um, try and focus more on other things. COVID is just one little thing. And if you get caught up on it and go on, to, like I am, some sort of mad rant about COVID... It's not going to end well, including you're going to run out of time at the end of the paper. So go careful. So here's the next figures talking about planning decisions. So based on our sales forecasts, which are based on previous performance, and we're analysing the whole sector, um, be that European, be that in the UK, depending where my business is compared to Next or Burberry, obviously, um, and we've come up with some sales figures. We think that our trend for online is going to continue to grow. Um, and we can see that a big chunk of our operating profits are from online. We then decide to invest in our algorithms, our warehouses, our fulfillment centres. Um, maybe we're working strategically with the likes of DHL, for example. So we're working with that um, strategic partnership to improve our fulfillment processes lower costs overall hopefully we can improve the profit margin from that as well how can we improve returns for example if we're selling more stuff online the likelihood of in increased returns are higher how do we cope with that in our stores well we're still spending money on our stores yeah this looks significantly lower. It's not that lower, to be honest with you, if you think where their profits are. So this is operating profit. They're still spending a lot of money on their stores. This is probably closing old stores and opening new stores. This is ref refitting existing stores to make them look beautiful. You don't want old, tired retail. Go and walk into some of the older neglected sports direct stores and it's literally like a sports jumble sale but then again that's their market position they've got their flagship stores which are lovely swanky and they're paying a small fortune for them but when you pop into sunny corby um then it is what it is you're going in there for cheap trainers and because i was popping into asda this next door so you have to think about those things. Now look here as well. Finance is 19.4% of their operating profits. Okay? And it's only 5.3% of their revenue. This is a very high profit margin product. Now, you've all seen Clara, or Klarna even. I don't know who Clara is. Um, and, you know, it's that convenience, let me get you in debt and let's sell you the perception of buy now, pay later. Um, back in the day, when I was a sales manager for Sony, we would train. They employed Dalmatians. We would train our salespeople to talk people out of paying for TVs, cash, or on their own credit card. So we had different forms of, of finance. First is cash. Yes, we're going to get the cash. Is in the business. Cash is king, according to Drucker. Um, and great, let's get the cash in the till. 
Okay, we make the profit margin. Hopefully we didn't have to discount the TV to sell it. The next one is interest-free credit. Well, interest-free credit benefits the consumer. Maybe I'm charging a higher price for the TV to offset the cost of the finance. If I'm just giving interest-free to, to come up with a special deal, that finance is costing me money. Lower profit opportunity. Normally, customers don't ask for discount if it's interest-free, by the way. But then you've got buy now, pay later. So we would turn around, my salespeople would turn around to customers and say, you save that cash for now. Why don't you leave it in the bank and it can get some interest on it, yeah? Pay nothing today. We'll get your TV delivered for you. I'll put the delivery cost on top of um, on top of your charge and we'll give you that for um, at zero down today as well. So I can add the delivery cost in, make the ticket price a bit higher. Then I'll interest free, sort of, for the first nine months. As long as you pay it off in nine months, don't pay any interest. Neglect to mention that it's a 35% APR interest rate at nine months. It's written on the credit agreement. And that's why the UK government changed the finance um, rules in the retail sector. So actually, the perception of buy now, pay later is not a new one for Next. Their Next catalogue was you, you would get this 400-page catalogue, for example. You'd pick them up. They were great big piles of them um, in the stores in the good old days before the internet. You would take it home. You would dream about yourself in these things. You don't have the cash. You call up their um, sales team before the internet, remember, and you would order it. You wouldn't pay anything. It would come within a, probably a week in those days, and then I would pay it back eventually. This is the paying back eventually. This is the next card. So they will have their own in-store cards, which are about, probably around about 35% interest. Um, but it's all sold on the basis of convenience. Consumers in the UK are addicted to this form of finance, and if we're anything like the, the US, we will owe more on buy now, pay later than we will on mortgages if we're not careful. Um, and it's 30 odd percent interest. That's like getting a credit card if you've got really bad credit rating. So you have to think about these forms of finance. But look at it. It's wonderful. And some cross selling here, because if you've got a next account, they'll just send it out to you and then if you pay it within the window of interest free, then great. If not, they make even more profit from you. And they're already making hundreds of percent markup on their clothes, a very good part of their business model. And don't underestimate how important this is and how much this will probably grow with squeezes on real income. I really need a new pair of jeggings. Can't afford any. I want to go out clubbing. Clearly, I'm class clubbing in jeggings. And... I go in, I'm not paying anything for them, okay? It's that concept of urgency that retailers are very good at selling us. So, over trading. Now, obviously we've got our example from Lunya um, and we've talked about obviously the profits here, the problems and you know they're owing a lot of money and then suddenly they're losing money in a year. Is this a bad thing? Well, you need to think if it's good or if it's bad. Is this over trading that's going to end in tears and liquidity issues and never mention bankruptcy unless the case study mentions it, by the way? Um, we understand that this is a risky model, but we understand they're at the beginning of their growth cycle. OK, you need to decide if they're expanding too quickly with limited resources. We saw the impact on ASOS, but they thought it was a good business decision. If they hadn't have grown, maybe they would have missed out on that future um, sales opportunity. They didn't know that Sheen were going to suddenly come in and gobble up market share and consumers were going to go back to shops. They thought everyone was going to continue to buy their stuff online because they had lots of loyal customers. Well, they didn't know at the time. This was factored into some sort of risk calculations, one would hope. But they were very, very confident in their own success. Why not? Based on their track record. However, with our crystal ball in 2024, we understand that there was a risky solution. So I'm not going to read through all of this because you can read as well as I can, hopefully better. Um, but the pros of overtrading is 
you don't want to miss out on that growth opportunity. Okay, um, if I'm growing rapidly, I'm building that market presence and my competitors aren't. Yeah, so this could be a massive opportunity for growth. And if I'm not brave enough, uh, maybe I miss out on the opportunity. I'm also making more luxury silk pajamas in this case, if we're talking about Lunya, um, and maybe it brings down my cost of production. If I can bring down my cost of production of making them and I can maintain my premium 300 quid for a pair of PJs, I'm making more profitability. This helps me to sort this profitability issue out in the future. Without ramping up production, then maybe I miss out on this opportunity to benefit from economies of scale. Remember, this is a dangerous term if you don't contextualise it properly. Um, I'm absolutely positive that many, many students across the UK will just drop, therefore resulting in economies of scale in their, ar in their arguments. Um, and welcome to level two, children. The problems are running out of cash. These guys, small company, limited cash reserves, probably guaranteeing the debt with with their suppliers against their own personal assets. Um, that's the problems. Quality, if you suddenly ramp up production and it's not to the same quality as before, this company is building its brand on luxury and quality. Look at the reviews we had in the last video. Um, so think about that. By ramping up, if you if you suddenly decide to use another supplier, this is a classic um, A level question: Should they go with a new supplier because the old ones put their prices up or something like that? Well, is it going to be to the same standards? If I change my supplier from Spain to China, yes, I might make it a bit cheaper, uh, but really. What about the quality that I might be sacrificing? It doesn't mean the Chinese can't make it to the same standards, by the way. And that would be a however point, wouldn't it? Um, increased debt and the financial risks. Well, I've mentioned that quite a lot of this will be taken on probably by the shareholders themselves, the directors themselves. The risk of inventory um, is a fickle industry. If you get stuck with all of that stuff, you're going to end up discounting it to get rid of it. That's going to hammer your profit margins. Operational strain, as in you need more staff to cope with more work. Now, with Lunya, we saw that they took on people for their early growth, and then suddenly they weren't making any profit, and then they got rid of some of their staff. Now, I don't know who those staff are. I don't know if it's because they've suddenly outsourced their warehouse to another company, therefore they don't employ those staff. There's lots of unknowns there, but it could be that they say, we've just got to cut our overheads. And then we have a motivational theory question that says about job enlargement. And in the short term, an entrepreneurial team that might be really excited about a growing brand might just work longer hours, might just take on extra responsibilities. Then we've got possible problems in the future with people not doing things right. I don't know what that would be. Maybe there's customer service problems. Maybe they start not looking after the Selfridges contract as well as they did before. There could be lots of things. Or staff, after a short period of time, if job enlargement continues, they might suddenly realise that they're working a lot harder and they get fed up. Staff that are fed up either presentism, they come to work, they work to rule. That's not going to help you if you've got people that normally go above and beyond the call of duty. Um, or it could be they just jump ship and go somewhere else. OK, so we have to think about that. And the market perception, if you're over trading and they see these noticeable declines, it could damage the brand. And I mentioned the, B to, the B2B relationship with the department stores. If that is also the B2C relationship on their website or customer service teams, then actually this is a premium product. I'm expecting a premium service or I'm not spending 300 quid on a pair of silky pajamas. Hopefully that was useful and um, thank you very much.